Thank you. Now we would like to welcome Aug Augsburg President Paul C. Pribinow. President Pribinow was elected as the 11th president of Augsburg, Augsburg College in 2006. He has a distinguished career in academia. President Pribinow is a strong proponent for the tradition of Lutheran higher education and its concepts of vocation and service. This is also Dr. Pribinow's third MLK convocation with us. Thank you so much for your support as we hope to work with you in promoting initiatives that emphasize the importance of common work and diversity on this campus and in the community. President Pribinow. Thank you. It's my deep privilege to welcome all of you to Augsburg College and to this 22nd annual convocation in celebration of the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. My thanks to our students, faculty, and staff who have worked with great skill and passion to organize our convocation. My special welcome to our distinguished guest, Charles McDo, who will deliver the keynote address. And my sincere appreciation to all of you who have made this gathering not only a part of your day of remembering Dr. King, but also a time of seeking a call to action to live on the paths of peace, reconciliation, and social justice that were at the heart of his life and work and ministry. Coincidentally, I was in Atlanta last week and happened upon the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church where Dr. King grew up with his father as senior pastor, and where he served as co-pastor and delivered some of his most memorable sermons. This was the church where Dr. King was surrounded throughout his life by a beloved community of friends and family. This was the church where Dr. King learned and preached the gospel with such power and passion. This was the church where Dr. King was formed as a person of faith who longed for peace and justice in this country and throughout the world and who worked to make it a reality through his public ministries. For all of this evocative history of Dr. King and the Ebenezer congregation, there is an apt lesson, I think, in the fact that the historic Ebenezer sanctuary is now a national historic site, essentially a museum. Ebenezer Baptist Church still exists, now lodged in a new modern building, and it's important and historic work goes on in the 21st century. But that place that shaped Dr. King's life and work no longer exists in the same way. And I wonder how that fact offers us an important caution as we gather here in 2010 in this place to consider how we might honor Dr. King by carrying forward his work, his ministry, his faith and passion for peace and justice. At a minimum, it seems to me, we must use occasions like this to think about what it means that we can't take for granted that the historic places that shaped people like Dr. King to pursue his work on our behalf no longer exist in the way they once did. The truth is we shouldn't take any of this for granted because our work together on the path set by Dr. King is more important and more relevant today than it has ever been. This intentionality about our shared public work to make the world more fair and peaceful and just seems especially significant these days in our lives. What would Dr. King have to say about the murders of innocent neighbors at the Seward Market just a few days ago? And what would Dr. King have to say about the horrific situation of those in Haiti suffering in the aftermath of the earthquake, suffering not only from the natural disaster but also from decades of poverty and neglect. I have no doubt he would have much to say and much to do if he were still in our midst. But he is not here, and we are. The wondrous gift we have from Dr. King to face our work in the world takes us right back to the historic sanctuary of Ebenezer Baptist Church, where in early February 1968, just two months before his assassination, Dr. King stood in the pulpit and preached a sermon that has recently been brought to my attention again by our colleague Harry Boyt, the co-director of the Center for Democracy and Citizenship here at Augsburg. That sermon, entitled The Drum Major Instinct, is a clear example of Dr. King's remarkable ability to describe the human predicament. Commenting on the story in Mark's Gospel about John and James asking to be seated at Jesus' left and right hand in heaven, 
Dr. King says that the two disciples are like all of us who desire human recognition and importance. As he tells the Ebenezer congregation, this longing for earthly forms of recognition is the pathology of our human nature, the instinct that if not harnessed can become dangerous for individuals and for societies. Though you might think that Dr. King would suggest that the only faithful response to this human predicament, this need to be recognized, this need for our egos to be stroked, is to go to the opposite extreme, to humble servitude, to sacrifice, to self-effacement. But that is not what he preaches or practices. Instead, Dr. King says that if being a drum major is the human instinct, then what faithful people need to do is to take up the work of being drum majors for what God intends for God's people. Be drum majors for love, for moral excellence, for generosity, for justice and peace in God's world. This is how Dr. King was formed by Ebenezer Baptist Church, to be a drum major for greatness in service to the neighbor. And this is the legacy we have from this place called Ebenezer and this man named Martin, to reflect on how we will be drum majors for reconciliation and peace here in our neighborhood in 2010, to reflect on how we will be drum majors for service to our fellow global citizens in Haiti to meet their needs now and in the future, to believe that God intends for us to be drum majors for justice and righteousness in the 21st century. As Dr. King concludes his stirring sermon, yes, Jesus, I quote, I want to be on your right and on your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. I think we can all say amen to that. It's great to have you here. Thank you, President Pimpernel. Before we introduce Marimba Africa, we would like to take a moment to recognize two very special people in the Oxford community. The MLK Convocation Committee annually recognizes two people who have demonstrated peace, love, humility, integrity, and honor while working with others on or off campus. These awardees have been nominated by their peers and exemplify the spirit of Martin Luther King Jr. The committee recognizes one student and one faculty or staff member. This year's faculty recipient is Professor Richard Spratt. Richard Spratt has been involved with the Augsburg Social Work Department for decades. Serving as an adjunct faculty since 1995, he has been a field instructor for the BSW and the MSW programs and has served on the field advisory committee. Spratt also served on the intergroup dialogue project implementation team and has been a mentor to numerous students. Currently, Spratt works with the Hennepin County Children Family Services where he was, found, where he was the founder of West Broadway Village in innovation public's uh, social service, uh, services office. His extraordinary community service includes Powderhorn Community Agency Restorative Justice, House and Land Use, NASW, and the Nellie Stone uh, Johnson School in Hawthorne neighborhood. He holds a BA from Augsburg and MSW from the University of Minnesota. Please stand and be recognized. This year's student recipient for the Spirit of MLK Award is Robert Goodman. As the president, as the president of the Multicultural Student Organization at Anoka Ramsey Community College, Robert Goodman learned that an organization for students of color can bring awareness to a campus community. After transferring to Augsburg, Goodman was involved in the development of the, of the, development of the Augsburg Indigenous Student Association, writing the organization's constitution and promoting it to the students. At Augsburg, Goodman is a McNair Scholar and a participant in TRIO. He works as a mentor, tutor, and role model with Native high school students in the All Nations program at South High and serves on the board of directors for the Paul Revere Co-op. He strives to be a good role model to his children and to those around him. 
After graduation, Goodman plans to continue his education in graduate school. Please stand and be recognized. Now it is time to introduce Marimba Africa. Marimba Africa is made up of many well-known musicians in the Twin Cities. Its leader and founder, Saima Matun Tsungiri, is a legendary Sokus music musician. Marimba Africa plays music influenced by reggae, calypso, Latin, Afro-funk, and Sokus tradition. Now presenting Marimba Africa.
Thank you, Marimba. Thank you, Marimba. Um, you know that was a great performance, you know, and you see, you didn't see nobody moving, but you saw a foot tapping like, <laughs> little body started moving, but then nobody else in the movie was like, oh, you know, you gotta catch it. <laughs> um, but thank you, can, I, can you just show some more love for Marimba, please? Um, I, would I would now like to ask Professor Jeff Kolnick uh, to join us in uh, welcoming and introducing our honored guest this afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to, I don't think anybody's asked uh, for thanks for the MLK Convocation Committee and Mohammed Salam. So let's uh, give those guys a. Events like this take an awful lot of work and they deserve our, our recognition and, and our thanks. Uh, I'm humbled again to be a part of the MLK Convocation and to be part of anything connected to the life of Dr. King. And I want to thank Augsburg College for the honor. It's been a real privilege over the last four years to be a part of this community uh, and uh, I'll miss it. I want to give thanks to the mistress and master of ceremonies there. Uh, It's hard to get up here and speak before a, a crowd like this in a building like this, and you did it very well so far. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of the musicians, uh, too. It was absolutely beautiful music, and to the steppers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, it was really good. Uh, today, we celebrate the life of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King in the midst of historic times. Almost one year ago to the day we inaugurated Barack Obama as President of the United States, and he's had a tumultuous first year, but... <laughs> then, as now, the nation remains stuck in a deep economic depression with very, very high rates of unemployment and underemployment, and of course, the seniors who are graduating this year are looking at a, at a tough, uh, tough future when you, when you come out of here, similar to actually when I graduated. 20-something uh, years ago. Uh, state and local governments, including our own, are broke or are going broke. The nation is fighting two wars with unclear goals. Our planet is in peril. And of course, the great natural disaster in Haiti, a nation of dramatic historic significance for the people of Africa, African descent, has captured all of our attention lately. I'm reminded of Dr. King's call for the United States and the world to confront the evils of racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism at the end of his life. Today's speaker is well acquainted with the sweep of history, having made more than his share over the course of a lifetime committed to struggle and justice. Like Dr. King, Charles McDo has lived a life committed to confronting all of the complex problems facing us today, not just segregation, but the whole range of problems facing us. During the most intense days of the modern civil rights movement, McDo was at the center of things. Among his many notable activities, he was the founder and chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, having served in that position longer than any other person. And if you had the chance to meet people who were in SNCC, to be elected their chair is a remarkable thing. I've been lucky to get to know McDo and the previous two MLK Day speakers here at Augsburg. Before I met Chuck, I got to know Mike Felwell as a, as a novelist, not as an activist. And when I called, uh, Professor Thelwell, before I was going to meet McDo, I said, I'm going to meet this guy, Chuck McDo. What do you know about him? And Thelwell said, everything McDo tells you, Kolnick, is true. <laughs> so listen to what he says. And I say that by way of introduction to Chuck because that will help you prepare for his remarks. Everything Kolnick is true, he said. So listen to him closely. Uh, on 2009 day speaker, our MLK speaker on 2009 was Hollis Watkins. And McDo met Hollis in Macomb, Mississippi when they spent time organizing and in jail together. And fellow SNCC activist Bob Moses wrote of that jail cell this way. I hope one day Augsburg can bring everybody from that jail cell since they <laughs> had two now. But this is uh, 12 of us here sprawled out along the concrete bunker. Curtis Hayes, Hollis Watkins, Ike Lewis, Robert Talbot, four veterans of the bunker are sitting up talking, mostly about girls. Charles McDo, tell the story, is curled into the concrete wall. I'm sitting with smuggled pen and paper, thinking a little, writing a little. This is Mississippi, 
the middle of the iceberg. Hollis is leading off with his tenor, Michael Rowe, the boat ashore, alleluia. Christian brothers, don't be slow, alleluia. Mississippi's next to go, alleluia. This is the tremor in the middle of the iceberg from a stone that the builders rejected. Bob Moses also said of Charles McDew that he was black by birth, Jew by choice, and revolutionary by necessity. You will find out soon why his nickname in the movement was Tell the Story. It is an honor to bring up a man who risked his life to make our world a fairer place and who worked side by side with Dr. King to achieve the dream of ridding the world of racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. I bring to you Charles McDew to speak on We Are the Ones We Have Been Waiting For. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are the ones we have been waiting for. As we began the meeting, um, we started, of course, with lift every voice and sing. I remember uh, one of the verses we didn't say was the one refers to we are the ones we have been waiting for. It's the second verse. And that verse says, we have come over a way with which with tears have been watered. We have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. And I think of the slaughtered over the years. And I think of when I became involved in the struggle and uh, when we were in that sale that, that Jeff just mentioned in Macomb, Mississippi, there's a, a movie out that depicts a part of that time and that history. The, the movie's uh, called Freedom Song. Freedom Song, which is, oh freedom, oh freedom, oh freedom over me. Before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my God and be free. And that part, our part in the struggle started uh, really 50 years ago, never thought it would happen. In fact, we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee uh, this April in North Carolina at Shaw University. Um, and I remember when we first formed SNCC, and I remember talking to people as we were recruiting students to be involved with us. And one of, one of the parents of one of the kids we invo in, uh, recruited back years ago, Martha Norman's father, remembered what I told him when we were recruiting people. I said that if you give your daughter to the struggle, and let us, her join us in SNCC, you will see, we will make more changes in this country in the next five years than have been happening in this country in the last 400 years. I said, I promise you, we will do that. With the election of Barack Obama, it was a part of fulfilling a promise we made to each other years and years ago. Because when we started, we said that one of the things that has to happen is we will change this country. But understand that change is price, is, uh, has a price. As uh, Frederick Douglass said, let me give you a, a word, the philosophy of reforms. The whole history of the progress of human liberty shows 
that all concessions yet made to her claims have been born of earnest struggle. If there's no struggle, there's no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one or it may be a physical one, or, may, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Frederick Douglass said that years ago. And we looked at that, and we studied that, and said in this struggle, one of the things that has to happen is that there's a blood price that's going to be paid for our freedom. And we are standing up and saying, we will pay the price. We knew that. And we knew that uh, many of us would not see the end of that struggle. We said that progress for black people has often been stopped by violence, the bombings, the shootings, the killings. But we had to, to, whatever happened, we had to keep on. These things would happen, and we had to keep on. In Freedom Song, in that movie about that struggle, the guy who plays me in the movie uh, said one time, uh, they were, we were doing a film, uh, about when we were arrested in Macomb, Mississippi, that incident that Jeff mentioned. And we were all in jail. We didn't realize initially when we were arrested that in Macomb, Mississippi, they had us all. They had every member of SNCC in the world in that jail. And we thought that that night the movement was going to stop. Stop. Because although we were in jail, they started coming to take us out. And I remember the first person they took was uh, Bob Moses, and, uh, and they beat him as they were taking him. And uh, Hollis Watkins who uh, Jeff also mentioned, was here the other day. And I remember when they came and got me and uh, took me upstairs and there was a, a group of men, about 300 white men, and they were kicking me and spitting on me and socking me. And, uh, and they took me to the end of this hallway and sit me down on this bench. And I was thinking, you know, it's, it's my time. Just keep your hands free. Hold, keep your hands free. Don't let them pin your hands. And I was thinking, I'm scared. I don't want to die. And I don't want to beg for my life. So just keep your hands free. And uh, the guy who played me in the movie was saying, well, Chuck, I'm having problems doing this, uh, playing you in this, in this movie, because every time I start, I start to do a scene, I start crying. So, so that's all right. So that's all right, Stan, you know. Uh, I cried too. I said, but what you have to, what you have to show is uh, how, how you came to grips with your sense of mortality. 
there I was, 19 years old, in the cell, preparing to die. And I was saying, so what you have to show is, is how I came to accept death is a price that had to be paid. So I was saying, just keep your hands free and, and you'll be all right. And he said, and I didn't understand that. What do you mean, keep your hands free? He said, well, we know, I knew, we knew, that when you were lynched in this country, the first thing they did was castrate you. You were always castrated before you were killed. And you were quite alive when you were castrated. So I was thinking, I'm about to die. And the first thing they're going to do is castrate me. So keep, I have to keep my hands free. So when they do that, maybe I can hold open the wound after they castrate me. And the blood will gush out and I could pass out. So keep your hands free. I said, you know, that's what I was thinking. And so I was sitting there thinking, I don't want to die. I wish I had never see, heard of this place. I never, wish I had never come here. But it's about to happen. And as I was sitting there, I noticed that there was blood on the floor uh, and it was my blood and I, uh, I didn't realize it, but I was bleeding from the eyes and, and, uh, and nose. And there was this man in front of me hitting me with a noose and saying, you son of a bitch, you son of a bitch, you'll never marry my daughter, you'll never marry my daughter, this white guy. And it sort of snapped me out of my deep thoughts. I'm sitting there thinking about dying. And there's this man beating me with this rope, saying, you never, you'll never marry my daughter. And I was saying, are you out of your mind? And said, like, I'm about to die, and you're talking about your ugly daughter, <laughs> who I never met and probably would never meet. And here's a man about to kill me to protect somebody I'll never see in life. I said, they're crazy. They're just, they're just crazy. And whatever happens tonight or in the future, this has to stop. This insanity has to be addressed. And that night, and thereafter, I was never afraid to die. I, I considered that it was my fate, whether then or later, to be killed by the violence of, of these race-hating people. And that was it. So from that point, point on, I obviously didn't die that night. But the thing that, that I did gain was that sense of not fearing that, death of having no concern about my life being taken because dealing with, you know, it's sort of like mad dogs. You, know, you can't reason with them. You just recognize that they come from a different place than you do, and they have a different sense of, of, of morality and a different sense of ethics and a different sense of what is human and what is right. And I was never afraid from then till now, or now, or in the future, of dying. So I said to uh, Stan, the guy who plays me, was playing me in the movie, that's what you have to, you have to convey. Because it happened for all of us. It happened for all of us. At some point, Every one of us came to understand and accept our sense of mortality. We have come over a way with 
which tears have been watered, we have come, treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered. Now here it is 50 years later, and the first thing I think of at these times of who it was among the slaughtered that uh, we buried. In SNCC, um, you know, we all sang in the movement, We Shall Overcome. But the, the song that was SNCC's particularly, we would sing when we ended a meeting of this may be the last time. This may be the last time we all sing together. It may be the last time, I don't know. This may be the last time we all see each other. It may be the last time, I don't know. This may be the last time. And I can remember so many faces, friends, comrades, lovers, whose hands I held as we were singing, who I never saw again after that meeting, who had been castrated, who had had their throats cut, who had had their heads blown off, who had died. And most of us in SNCC did die, violent deaths. So it gives me a sort of a, a sense of something, uh, meaning to my life that this April we will celebrate the 50th year of our founding. Um, and so when we get together to celebrate that 50th year, and I look around, since, since most of the people in SNCC I recruited, that was my job as chairman, to uh, get others to be with us in the struggle. And I recruited most of them, and we survived. And we're about to have this get together to really record what we've done, where we've been, and why we did what we did. Telling the truth, the people of the day before yesterday reach out to the people of the day after tomorrow, who will be here after we've gone. And it won't be that much longer. The Khan people of uh, West Africa have long celebrated a symbol called Sankofa for the guidance of their youth. The image depicts a bird in forward motion with its head turned backward. This equates to their proverb, go back to the past in order to build for the future. The conference we will have in, 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 in Raleigh uh, in a couple of months is uh, our Sankofa moment in history. Some two score and 10 years ago, a green band of patriots dared to pledge their lives, misfortune, and sacred honor to the proposition that human dignity, dignity can and must be a universal birthright, not as a dream or mere declaration of principle, but as a constant struggle. On February 1st, 1960, four students from A&T College, a historically black school in Greensboro, North Carolina, demanded service at a lunch counter in Woolworth's retail store in defiance of local laws forbidding integrated seating. Within a few months, 
sit-ins by mostly black college student, students erupted across the South. The atomic energy unleashed by the student sit-in explosion, importantly, altered the course of social and political life in the United States and influenced the course of human rights history throughout the world. After he went to jail for refusing to serve in the Korean War, um, he went to uh, India to work with Gandhi. Jim Lawson was the one who taught Martin Luther King about nonviolent direct action. Lawson was King's teacher, and he was the teacher of many of the students in SNCC when we started the, uh, the sit-ins in uh, 1960. No, so nonviolence, uh, to some, was a religious conviction, and to others, as the best tactic for uh, avoiding disastrous confrontations with the police and with mobs. Born of these novel moral tactics, SNCC prided itself on building a movement than merely an organization. It determined to draw its strength and wisdom, inspiration, and spiritual death from the souls of black folk in the South, as evidenced by its extraordinary flash appearance, turbulent career, and its seamless reappearance in a fiery burst of successes, causes, and movements. SNCC never was never about preserving itself. If it had been, it would have both operated like more traditional organizations, worrying more about cash and hierarchy than the soul of its revolution. The only legacy it sought was the altered condition of the people. Their awakened sense of self-empowerment was our dedication. Our creed was the ultimate liberation of the masses from deprivation and manipulation. Our ideal vision was of the last burden being lifted from the shoulders of the world's last oppressed women and men. While there have been many numerous efforts by individuals as amateurs, professional, uh, uh, commentators and historians to tell the SNCC story. The anniversary coming up is designed to be our grandest collective effort to date and interpret and measure from within all those aspects of SNCC as an enterprise, least we singly and silently disappear, still misunderstood. So where better to make that, that idea known than in our last gathering in April? This will be the last time. It'll be the last time, and, I, and that I know. You know, it is that time in life when many of us are living to that point where we never thought we'd never get to. And, and having natural growing old and dying. We just, in, in, in my life, you know, I, I thought none of us ever expected to be 30 years old. We just, uh, that was just an impossible dream. Because if you expected to be 30 years old, it was hard to go back. I mean, every time I would go south, and even today when I do that, I come back and say, you know, thank you, Lord, for letting, letting me pass through another day, another day. Because, you know, it hasn't been that long ago. I have a daughter who is 23, and uh, I've 
I've, I've taken her south with me uh, many times, several times. And I'm bringing her south with me uh, in April when we have this gathering. And, uh, and she used to ask when she was you know, like that big, Daddy, why do why you always say, you don't usually go to church, you don't usually pray, but why do you always go to church or pray after we come from down here? I said, you know, thank the Lord for bringing me out of here one more time. And I will always thank the Lord for bringing me out of here one more time. And this all began on April 1st and around Easter weekend, 1960. When we got together, students from different parts of, of uh, the United States and from every black college in the South. And, uh, and we formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Student Coordinating Committee, and we later, later added uh, nonviolence. And uh, one of the things we did was we planned the death of the organization in its morning. That is, when we created SNCC, we said that it will only last for five years. Um, one of the reasons we have to write our own history is because white historians got it all wrong. They say we, we split up because of black and white differences. That wasn't true. We split, we planned not to be around after five years. We didn't, we planned not to be around because we didn't want to become institutionalized. We didn't want to, we didn't want to be in a, in a position of being conservative in what we did for the sake of the organization. We didn't want to be concerned about protecting our image and that sort of business. And, uh, and, and fundraising, when people give you money, they think they have the right to tell you what to do. And we said, no, no, we ain't going there. No, y'all just go ahead on, keep your little 50 cents. <laughs> we'll deposit some pop bottles, sell some, 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 some copper, and, and we'll make it. Pick a little bit of cotton, we'll do whatever it, it takes, because we won't accept your money if you're gonna try to tell us what to do. Then, uh, and so we said, we'll only last for five years. And, uh, and then it's over. We lasted a bit longer, like eight years, but we, we quit because we said we were going to quit, and we quit when we said we were going to quit. So, and, you know, it's possible if, if you said, well, I only have to do this for five years, you can make it. And the other thing, the, the other reason was when we formed the organization and, and we had to have something to tell our parents. Many of us, were the first in our families who went to college. And so you couldn't just say, uh, look, mom, look, dad, uh, I'm going to go off and do this stuff. And, uh, you know, we were different than white students who were going to go off and find themselves. So how do you all lose yourself? And say, <laughs> so you hear white students say, I'm going to find myself. How you lose yourself, sport? <laughs> we were different in that way. We weren't going off to find ourselves. We were going off to change this country. And we did. And said it from the beginning. We said, we're going to, this is what we're going to do, and this is how long it's going to take us. Knowing full well, you wouldn't sit down with your mother and father and say, yeah, and it's only, only going to take us this long because most of us will be dead before this effort is over. 
Most of us will be dead before this happens. And, 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 and that was true. And we started out with like 15 people in the, in the creation of, of SNCC. There are six of us alive today. Six of us alive today. One of the reasons we must be go to great pains to collectively tell our own stories is not to involve in, in breast beating of SNCC, but rather to involve in a like a like audacity in generations yet to come. for people to change the world rather than accept victimhood. Hopefully through our stories, they will be assured that with no resources other than the courage of ideas, endurance, and mutual trust, they can meet the giant enemies of their day and slay them, however fearsome they may appear beforehand. More than anything else, it is important today to reemphasize self-empowerment over external appointment or anointment by those already in power. By making a permanent record of our narratives, our humor, our affection, and our songs, we can together convey what it meant to be a part of a happy insurgency against widespread and seemingly in, uh, insurmountable tyranny, terrorism, and tragic traditions. Least we forget the principal reason thousands of buds never bloom is for fear they might freeze, fail to find rain, or be crushed without being seen. The Counter counsel of SNCC story is to trust your buds into flowers and never stay die until you have been killed or you win. There's much that can be said about the stumblings, gropings, and mistakes that characterize the SNCC management. After all, we had no apprenticeship in large scale logistics for regional or national leadership, nor the challenges of facing down the entire weight of both the public and private establishment, nor for managing public relations on the world stage in the face of sophisticated daily propaganda assaults. We learned on the job and under constant fire. Yet it must be said to our eternal and undeniable credit that in spite of these many handicaps and shortcomings, there was never a single case of internal corruption in our ranks. No money was embezzled from our don donations, none of us embarrassed by our past affiliations or went over to the enemy by bribery or seduction. And no physical, political, or financial threat ever succeeded in determining or even altering our programmatic decisions and direction. That was so because we uh, suffered from no fears or incentives to do other than give power to the people, even in the face of death itself. Where in the history of American reform movements is there a superior record of institutional integrity? In return, our institutional loyalty has been equally steadfast to all of those who suffered in the trenches with us. When former, former SNCC participants and allies have come under attack for alleged or actual misdeeds after the 60s, they have not been disowned or written out of history in spite of mainstream press 
condemnation of government fun funded and tell pro propaganda. This is likewise a record of distinction among our fellow progressive organizations, both before and since, because our mutual loyalties have been dyed indelibly in blood rather than in self-interest. Uh, tomorrow, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll be in Colorado to see uh, Rap Brown, H. Rap Brown, who was, who was uh, one of the SNCC chairmen who is, is in prison for the rest of his life. And uh, here, celebration of Martin Luther King Day, we will see him. The rest of us, we will go out there and, and we will see brothers who are in prison, brothers and sisters who are hurt and ailing. We don't forget. We will see them. In return, our institutional loyalty has been steadfast to all of those who suffered in the trenches with us. When former SNCC participants and allies have come under attack for misdeeds of the 60s, they have not been disowned or written out of history. Furthermore, we not only sang the song and the words black and white together and placed clasped hands of black and whites together on our buttons and stationery. We massively lived it out in a way that no other progressive organization has until partially rivaled by the recent Obama campaign. When we said black and white together, we meant it. We put symbols of that and we lived it. Uh, at the time we came along, it was against the law, for example, for black and white people to marry. Uh, there were only two states in the United States of America where it was legal to, uh, for black and white people to marry. Uh, one was Minnesota, and the other state was New Mexico. See, so when you look around, you see all these integrated uh, people. That's one of the reasons that of, of seeing that here is it was against the law every place else. Uh, I remember when, when I first got my first wife, I always think it's so hip to say my first wife. Uh, my, fir <laughs> my first wife was, was white, still is, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and, but when we, got, when we got married, we had to talk about which country we were going to live in because law knows to just be confined to Minnesota and, and uh, New Mexico, that was going to be a, a tough road to hold for us. <laughs> So we talked about which country that would happen in. And so to get, to get married, you know, we had lined up lawyers and all that. We knew it was going to be a big case because you couldn't do that. An oft repeated rumor notwithstanding, Gender differences were never the criteria for assigning leadership or authority in our organization. Ella Baker, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ruby Smith, and many other strong women were leaders in our organization. It is the dual function of the words spoken by SNCC people uh, to serve the interests of both uh, catharsis and analysis. For those who were together on the journey of the 60s, there's a long 
longing to interpret the deeper meanings in, in the making of the human as well as the politically revolutionary movement. For those, the best use of this time would be to read the music and storytelling of our yesteryears into a narrative to motivate today's bling and me generations to, to walk more heavily upon earth, to bring the ground for those yet to come. For others studying us from afar, there's a thirst for the cold stuff of dates, names, places, and statistics. Their pre preference would be spending hours gathering historical facts in uh, casual relationships. Hopefully, we will tell our own stories. And many people, for many of you, it's the first time you ever heard of us. Um, so one of, the, one of the reasons we're getting together now is to record who, who we were, what we did, and what we did, and why we did what we did. Let me be clear, here and now, friend and foe alike, that's what it is, is decidedly not the motive of our coming together. Our coming together is not to reminisce nostalgically or to self-congratulate past accomplishments and reopen old wounds. It is not to rewrite the history in our favor, to, but to provide one of the missing chapters, to give a much needed perspective on all that has been accurately written and miswritten about us in our times. One of those is, you know, we're reminded of that of every Martin Luther King uh, Day celebration. It wasn't just Martin. There were hundreds of others, thousands of others, who made a statement, made a sacrifice, and put their bodies in the movement. And so I'm reminded that at each Martin Luther King Day, when I think, I don't think of Martin, I think of Ella Baker, and knew, knew Martin as, as well as, as I know anybody. Uh, but with SNCC, we were sort of different. I remember telling Martin, uh, Dr. King one day, I said, look, Martin, here's the deal. You give me an hour in your pulpit, and at best, I'll make you my assistant minister. Because <laughs> we had a message <laughs> and took back no back seats to nobody in, in what we were doing. He was a good man, as, as they were all good men, and, and, and comrades in the struggle. And we felt we had earned the right to say what we had to say because we were going to go where nobody else was going to go. We went to the places, when, when you, back then, if you mentioned Mississippi, it would send cold chills roughing down your spine. That we even some of our people, I know Julian always said, Julian Bond, uh, who was the director of SNCC's communication. Julian said, I just, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, I can't just, just can't handle Mississippi. I don't want to go there. I don't want to be no place by it. Don't want to be there. And there are places like that that, I, that are true like that for me. Last time I got out of prison in, uh, in Louisiana, and I was in jail for criminal anarchy, high treason against the sovereign state of Louisiana. And I remember uh, when I was in jail, the, the guards would bring people by to see me. And they had a speech that they would look, give and when they were showing me to these people, a speech that I can remember that to this day Cop would say, in this cell here is our nigger anarchist. You know what an anarchist is? 
An anarchist is one who endeavors to overthrow the state by force and violence. We can give this boy, meaning me, more time than they gave Francis Powers. Some of you are old enough to remember Francis Gary Powers. He was a, he was a pilot uh, on, a, on a spy mission over the Soviet Union. And his plane was shot down and they had him. Uh, the Russians had him in prison. And Louisiana white folks were saying, they got him, but we got you. And uh, so they would go with, with this, this thing. And for the months I was in solitary confinement, that's all I would hear every day. They'd bring people by to see me. We got this nigga anarchist, this man. Uh, the Russians have Gary Powers, but we have him. I was saying, trade me, trade me. <laughs> <laughs> Except, of course, the, Re the Russians didn't know who I was. <laughs> and they didn't give a damn about me. But that was one of those places. I mean, when I got out, when I got out of prison in Louisiana, If somebody t today said, you can go to the game next week with the, in the Super Bowl with the Vikings and, 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 and the Saints, and I'll give you $40,000 and a ticket and all your transportation, I'd say, give it to the church, brother. I do not go to Louisiana. <laughs> today, I, and I remember when I got, when I got out of, out of, out of Prison. Last time I was in Louisiana, I'd just gotten out of prison. And uh, my friend said, Chuck, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm all right. I said, what can we do? What can we get you? What can we get you? I said, get me my passport. I'm done. I want a plane on first, I want to ship a plane on the first thing leaving not Louisiana, the country. I'm done. I don't want to see the United States again in life. And uh, I remember the first plane leaving uh, was going to Venezuela from, to Caracas. I left from there to Caracas, from Caracas to London, from London to uh, Finland, to Finland, you know, as far as I could go. And one of the things I wanted to see, I wanted to see if there was some place in the world where white folks weren't crazy. <laughs> Just any place. I wanted to find some place where white folks weren't innately insane. So I went to, uh, to Finland and, you know, Later, later I came back, obviously. My students used to say, well, you said you weren't coming back. Why are you here? <laughs> so, so, I will not indulge you who I'm going to give a D plus at best <laughs> when you finish my class. <laughs> and not because of that, just because, you know, y'all don't study as well as you should as often as you should and know as much as you think you know. I came back. Uh, but it's been a, a long and rough road every step of the way. In fact, and I'm here in Minnesota because Minnesota shares a border with Canada. <laughs> I wouldn't live in places like Illinois and Arizona to save my life. I always, I feel comfortable when I am someplace where I can get to a free country in five or six hours. <laughs> and Canada is the place where I can get to. Got a little place up in Thunder Bay. I can get to. I can get out of here the next time you get crazy. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, Obama may be there now, howsomever.
President Palin may be in next year. Next, <laughs> in, two, in 2012, President Palin may be your, don't y'all moan? <laughs> because all that moaning is not going to translate into, into votes. President Palin might be that next. Because of the continuing need to struggle without rest, we who made up what found the sleepy 50s into the unique and vibrant 60s want the world to know the difference between the real thing and the hypocrisy. Public intellectuals pimping off the good name of radical talk devoid of radical action or sacrificial suffering in order to sell their books and lectures are not our legitimate heirs. Their strong talk is a pale shadow of deeds, if not, if not outright mockery. And we swear to do our damnedest to not go gently into that good night without challenging a new generation of youthful activists to step up to the personal responsibility for continuing such hypocritical theatrics at the expense of progress. We want to challenge a cadre of new abolitionists to put their bodies where the lyrics of their rap and hip hop music profess their, their hearts are. It's not just the verbal protests, it's about action. Words are never a substitute for work. To borrow Doug from Douglas, they never have been and they never will be. It's time for proud talkers to put some skin in the game, to walk the walk as well as to talk strong talk. Because that's what we do. We don't just walk the walk and talk the talk. We did what we said we would do. Uh, did you, excuse me, y'all. How long did I have? Five minutes? Y'all, excuse me, Mr. President, and due respect. See, I, I thought, see, in the past, I've, I've been to these things, and, and my friends, Michael Thelwell, <laughs> spoke like Castro, four or five hours. <laughs> <laughs> However, I, I, will, I will not speak like Castro, four or five hours. Uh, so I'm, I'm really in a small way, How, howsoever. Well, it was just, what I want you all to know is we used to say, uh, you know, we love your intellectual commitment and we love your emotional understanding, but you got to put your intellectual understanding and your emotional commitment to where your bodies are. You have to take, bring your body into the struggle or it doesn't count. Uh, rapping about the evils of the world and, and uh, you know, making a few bucks and not doing anything doesn't count. You have to put your, your body into the movement. Uh, and we learned that as very young people and we kept strong in the struggle. Um, This, Martin Luther King's Day, and all others, like it will be our Sankofa, are looking back to prepare for the future and uh, in what we're going to do. So in that spirit, say Sankofa, and we shall.